You ready to have church? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Let me get down here where y'all can see everybody, not just me. Ready? Hold this. Hold this for me. So I, I got to do the motion. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. 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 Now, that's a real good, but that's not a lot of to do. Let's try this again. <clears throat> One, two, ready, go. I don't know what you can do, but I can praise the Lord. I don't know what you can do, but I can praise the Lord. I don't know what you can do, but I can praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Much better. Good morning. I'm so glad y'all are all here today on this homecoming, 133 years old. Isn't that something? Come on in here. Today's a special day not only for homecoming. Today we also have a baptism. Now this is Felicity Ballard. And her sister, if you remember last year, Olivia, was baptized on homecoming. Exactly one year later, after youth camp, Felicity made a decision for Jesus Christ. Amen. Felicity, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, Come right around here. Sit right, right down here on this bench. Now watch, the preacher didn't put his tie in here and I'll be dipping. So I got to stick my tie in. Felicity, do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Yes, sir. Do you believe he lived a sinless life? Yes, sir. Do you believe he died upon the cross of Calvary for your sins and my sins and the whole world's sin and they'll just repent and receive him as Lord and Savior? Do you believe he rose from the grave bodily? Yes, sir. Felicity, upon your decision to accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The reason the church was planted here 133 years ago was to reach lost souls for Jesus Christ. Amen. We have purpose. Now, each one of you is here from a different location. I'm so glad that you're here and maybe uh, you, you've been away at your, your home church. I hope that if you're here and that you've been a member here before, that you're active serving the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's why the church, the, the problem in the world today is not the politics alone. It's because the people of God are not serving the risen Savior and believing what the Bible says. Today is a big day for you. Brother Sean Parker is going to be coming up in a little while after we praise and worship, but he's going to be presenting the gospel. But not just to tickle your ears. It's transforming to the light that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Let's pray in the name of Jesus this morning. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, just for your presence and your love. We thank you so much for Felicity today, Lord. I thank you, God, Lord, for her decision. I thank you so much for the children's camps and the youth camps, Lord, that above all, it's about presenting the gospel, Lord. Father, we, we do the best we can. We're a little church. It's a lighthouse in the middle of this home of Chitter Forest. I pray, Father, that we will have unity, that we will have strength, and that, Lord, you'll always find us busy serving you, God, not just coming up with things to do, but serving you, Father. I pray today, Father, that you'll anoint Brother Sean, uh, Lord, just to be able to speak words that, that's beyond just anything he studied, Lord but things to touch each heart. I pray for hearts to be receptive to the word, that, Lord, that their lives will be transformed today. I thank you so much for all the hands that prepared meals, Lord. So many people have done so much. They cleaned the church. They set the tables, Lord. They, they did so much so that others will be blessed, Father. But above all, Lord, we want to bless your holy name, Father. 
Oh, Lord, you are welcome here. Fill this place, we ask, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Mount Pleasant Baptist Church for our homecoming. I have just a few bits of history of the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, which was compiled by Miss Onita Hollinsworth. On October the 13th, 1891, H. Hiller of the First Bank delivered a deed for five acres of land to the trustees of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. In 1891, John Walsh was the first person to be buried in the cemetery that's across the road. August of 1916, the church voted to sell the organ for only $2.50, and they would use that money to buy a new organ. In May of 1935, the church agreed to pay Reverend Pope only $300 a year. On November the, in November of 1944, a motion was made to start a building fund for a new church building. In March of 1945, the building fund was only $219. By February 9th of 1947, the building fund had grown to $2,024. Mr. Grady Whittington, chairman of the building committee, reported that the plans for a new church had been drawn up by Mr. Jacobs. The church voted to build the new church across the road, which is the building right next to the sanctuary here on the right. On the third Sunday of July in 1948 was the opening day for the new church. Brother McCool was pastor at that time and was paid $500 a year. In May of 1956, eight years later, the building had been paid for and there was $113 left in the building fund. In 1953, the first Bible study was held here. In 1966, the educational building, which is the building on the other side of this building to the right, was built. In 1938, the church steeple was added to the church that is located to the right of here. On July 13, 1986, the members voted to build a new sanctuary and additional Sunday school rooms. In June of 1988, the first worship service was held in this sanctuary. In February of 2012, the new fellowship hall where we will be eating lunch was completed and dedicated. Now for some more current events. Homecoming for 2023 was, in July, was on July 16th. Brother Ellis Hollinsworth was the speaker. We've had four families join our church family this year and several baptisms. During the year, the senior ladies enjoyed fellowship and eating out several times. In October, we had a bridal shower for Manette Whittington's granddaughter, Shelby Adams, and in February, one for Amberly Wallace. In October of 2023, a new adult Sunday school class was started and is being taught by Brandon Thurman. Fall Fest was on October the 29th. We had a chili cook-off, hot dogs, games, bounce house and lots of treats were enjoyed by all. In November, the youth went to the Judgment House at Tyler Town Baptist Church. We've had a couple of baby showers for Nikki Savoy and Kristen Hollisworth. We've had painting parties that have been very popular this year. Excuse me. We've had painting parties that have been popular and there have been several. Everyone has enjoyed the food and the fellowship while they were painting. Some of the ladies participated in a ladies' conference in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and, men, and some of the men participated in a men's conference in Huntsville, Alabama. December 24th, Christmas Cantata, O Holy Night, was directed by Tyler Scott. On February 10th, we had a, van a Valentine's banquet. March 30th was the annual Easter egg hunt. Throughout the year, there have been several fundraisers for the children and the youth camp. The Easter cantata was on March 31st. The cantata was written and directed by our music director, Tyler Scott. Vacation Bible School was May 25th through the 31st. The theme this year was scuba. 
We averaged 65 children and 33 adults in attendance. The offering that was taken up is designated for Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Ministry. The youth attended youth camp at Tall Timbers from June the 27th through the 31st. Where there were eight girls and three chaperones that went. July 15th through the 17th, the children's camp was at Camp Garraway. Sixteen children and five chaperones attended. We now offer children's church on Sunday morning. In the evening on Sunday, we have Bible drill for the children. On Mondays, there's a men's Bible study. And on Wednesday evenings, we have the RAs, GAs, and youth classes. Throughout the year, we have had baby boomerang, baby bottle boomerang for the Crisis Pregnancy Center, donations for the Baptism Children's Village, Annie Armstrong, Margaret Lackey, and Lottie Moon. Thank you all for your attention. Change on the fly, I like it. I don't, I don't know. I just, sort of sounded good. Okay. Good morning. Homecoming is a great and wonderful thing. It, it has the reminder of that great homecoming we're going to have when we all go see Jesus. Former music minister here, Larry Cotton, once told me, he said, I don't care what kind of songs you sing, I don't care what you do, but every church needed to have a little talk with Jesus. So let's stand up. That's what we're going to do this morning. Have a little talk with Jesus. Here we go. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. Well, he made my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our pain and he will answer by Now when you feel the presence of turning, when you know a little part is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus. Number two, here we go, second time. Sometimes my past seems drear without a ray of cheer, and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. Now this of sin may rise. Let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our truth. He will hear our faith and we will have to come on just let me hear. Bunch of bad if we go sing we clap. We'll find a little talk with Jesus. Last bird, here we go. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. Well, He will hear and he will now when you and you know the power you will find the power one more time again now let us have young ones, we got some old ones like Robbie, and we,
just torn up pages in this book Words that tell me I'm no good Chapters that define me for so long But the hands of grace and endless love Dusted off and picked me up Told my heart that hope is never gone God is in this story God is in the details Even in the broken parts He holds my heart Talk with Jesus. What does he tell us to do? Follow in his footsteps. So let's all stand up together. Footsteps of Jesus. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling. Come, follow.
Now we'll get to the old people part of the program. Robbie? Okay, Brother Tyler. You know, I got a, I got, uh, before I sing this song, I need to apologize, Brother Tyler. He's always talking about how well he likes dumplings. Every time we eat, what does he say? Chicken and dumplings. Well, I want to apologize, Brother Tyler. I made a jelly cake, and I got the idea to put dumplings in between the layers, but Lori wouldn't let me. So it's just a jelly cake. I was going to help you out there, but she said, no, uh, you can't do that. But uh, this song that I'm going to sing, uh, a couple of Sundays ago, Mr. Delano called me over and wanted to know if I, what I could sing his song and uh, found out what song it was. And uh, first, one of the first times I ever heard this song was right here. Uh, Miss Peggy's brother, Kim Sterling, was singing it at my daddy's funeral, standing right here. So, but we're going to do this for Mr. Delano. I have heard that what's a bird has a bro could win. It can never fly high anymore. But let me tell you what I know. That's not always so. For one side, they help us, and so I fell from. Like a wound of dust But no hope of ever climbing again But with grace from above God's marvelous love I'll fly higher than I've ever seen It's 
God has blessed this church with a choir of young and old. Everyone's talented. We're going to sing five songs, the choir is, from five different generations of this church. We started in 1800, 1893. What was the, what was the number? 1893. This, uh, we have a song that was wrote in 1893. One was wrote in 1910, 1912, 1950, and 2011. So... Y'all enjoy the amazing Mount Pleasant Orchestra and Choir as we sing our medley. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is Christ alone. 
Stay good. There will be no children's church this morning, so we will all stay here and we will all enjoy together. Yesterday I was here at the church uh, getting the music together for the uh, choir to sing. I had my phone playing. And a song came on. It's what I'm supposed to do. And the Lord spoke to me somehow, however you want to call it, through my spirit, through my whatever. Said, you may need to prepare that song just in case you're special, can't come. Well, I thought that was silly. My special always here. But I did. And this morning, Natalie was supposed to sing. She has an eye issue, sir, just an infection. You'd be in prayer for her. But I say all that to say this. Be prepared to serve God at all times. You never know when God wants you to. You ain't got to be the best. I promise you I ain't the best. I ain't as good as Robbie, and he's old. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you be prepared to serve how and when God allows you to. This song I love because I have a promise God has given me that I claim every day. And that's what it's called. It's called God Kept His Promise. God spoke to Abraham here is your desire you and your wife Sarah are going to have a child Abraham responded we are old how can this be but God said I promise you and Sarah, you just believe. And God kept his promise. He honored his word. The womb that was empty has not. And the seed will number the sands of the sea. 
Because you believe, God kept his promise. Many thousand years later, on a hill called Calvary, Jesus was dying, his body could read. When he cried, it is finished, they took his body down. And God's redemption promise was laid in the ground. Very early in the morning, whoo, on a came Mary bearing spices, his body to see. When she got to the tomb, Two men in white were there to say that God kept his promise and Jesus is alive today. And God kept his promise. He honored, oh, he honored his word. The tomb that is empty has all been done away he came out of that grave with power to save because you believe God kept his He came out of the grave with power to save because you believe, because I See how y'all smiling faces here today. 133 years the church has been planted here, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of you have a lot of things going on in your lives. Many of you are really busy. Many of you have been different places. The most important thing you're ever going to do is serve the Lord Jesus. The most important thing you're going to do, if you have roots connected here, I praise the Lord, but I pray wherever you are living at that you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. As our upcoming election is happening, the most important thing for you to realize is that your hope is not going to be in that individual. It's going to be in Jesus. Amen. That's the only one that can get us through everything that's taking place. He's the hope. He's coming back. He's coming back soon. Today, we have a privilege of Brother Sean Parker, Executive Director of the Mississippi Baptist Convention. He was with us several years ago. Praise the Lord. He was still willing to come back after that several years ago praise god and he is uh, going to present the gospel his wife elizabeth even came out here now i was scared now he, so i forgot to tell him about the bridge being out now that ain't nothing to us right because we so used to get around here and everything like that and then when i tried to call him of course i couldn't get him on the phone and like that i'm like oh lord i need a miracle today lord you open the red sea up you can get him all the way out here to Mount Pleasant. Sure enough, he come pulling up. Ellis says, he's out there. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Because <laughs> if you're not used to coming out here, you can actually get lost. I have a lot of uh, nurses that come to our house a lot, and it's hard to get around sometimes. But you know what's interesting, Treasure, is that <laughs> they got a new grandchild also. It's kind of funny when I think about it. We have one that just, just turned to. They have one that's 14 months old, and his name is Park. So you see that smile? Listen, they, all the accolades, usually all these different preachers come up, they want to give you all the letters behind their names and all these different things that they've been through, or, 
you know, all the education. No, they want to talk about the grandson, praise the Lord. <laughs> that shows you, young people, how important it is for the uh, grandparents to have those little ones, praise God. But today I want you to welcome Brother Parker as he comes and presents the gospel of Jesus Christ. He be with Brother Parker. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Blaine, and uh, it's good to be with you, Mount Pleasant, again. I don't get invited back very often, actually, so uh, <laughs> Mama invited me back to the woodshed a few times, but that's one of the rare occasions that I've been invited back, so it's great to be here, and uh, what a wonderful time of worship, uh, Brother Tyler, and uh, enjoyed all of the songs that we sang together and uh, those that uh, were shared with us by the soloists and uh, duets and so forth by the choir, so a uh, wonderful, wonderful time. I'm glad to, to be here to celebrate with you your 133rd anniversary. And uh, that makes you a great church. Uh, only influential, significant great churches last for 133 years. Basically, every church is going to die eventually unless the Lord comes. <clears throat> now that statement bothers people sometimes. But, but listen, some of the greatest churches we know about died. The church at Corinth died. The church of Galatia, the church of Thessalonica, they died. And so for a church to last 133 years is a remarkable accomplishment and a blessing of the Lord. And that makes you a great church. And I appreciate all that you have accomplished in the course of of your time. I'm, I'm going to read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. I'm a little hoarse today. You're going to have to overlook that. I do a lot of speaking, and so it catches up with me from time to time. And this is one of those occasions. Matthew, chapter 24, I'm going to begin reading with verse 36, and I want to read through verse 44. These are the words of Jesus in the context of his upper room sermon to his disciples. He was preparing them for the day when he would no longer be with them. And in verse 36 of chapter 24, this is what Jesus said to his disciples. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. I, I pastored local churches for 30 years before I began working with the Mississippi Baptist Convention Board, and... Uh, and as a, a church pastor, I was called upon pretty routinely to go to nursing homes and various other uh, like facilities and uh, lead worship services, and I always enjoyed doing that. Uh, but Brother Tyler, typically whenever I went to a nursing facility to lead a worship service on a Thursday morning, uh, I was a one-man show. I mean, when the pastor does this, you sing, you pray, you preach, you do it all. And uh, I, I was always okay with that, but I'm, a, I'm not a musician nor the son of a musician, so I was always a little bit concerned that we had somebody in the crowd who could play the piano or the keyboard or the organ or whatever might have been in the house. And so on, on a given occasion, I was headed to the nursing facility. I was running a little bit late. I walked in at the last minute. The receptionist said, oh, Brother Sean, we're so glad to see you. The residents have already gathered in the gathering area. They're waiting for you. And uh, I, I said, is anybody in there prepared to play the piano? And uh, she said, yeah, one of our residents is going to play the piano. And so I hustled on. 
And before I got out of earshot, she yelled at me and uh, she said, but, uh, but Pastor Parker, you need to know that uh, the resident who's going to be playing the piano is 95 years old and she has a tendency to forget what song she's playing and change songs in the middle of the, of the hymn. And so I thought, well, that'll be a challenge, but we'll make it through. And so I get in there, and as is the case in most nursing home services, we sang every song there was to sing about heaven. You sing about heaven a lot once you get to that age. And uh, as I recall, it was about the middle of the third stanza of When We All Get to Heaven that she shifted from playing When We All Get to Heaven to playing Dixie. And... <laughs> She played Dixie, and I sang all of Dixie that I could recall off the top of my head. And then we went back and sang the fourth stanza of When We All Get to Heaven. And for the life of me, I think I'm the only one who realized anything unusual had happened in the place. That's right. That's right. Well, that, that precious lady who had been playing the piano that day uh, was a United Methodist. And uh, she had played an instrument in the Methodist Church for 75 years before she finally retired. Her son was a Methodist pastor in Columbus where I pastored. I, I bumped into him not long thereafter and uh, I said, hey man, I was out at the nursing home just a couple of weeks ago and uh, we were doing a service and your mom was playing the keyboard and we were singing when we all get to heaven and before I could even finish my statement, he said, she started playing Dixie, didn't she? And I said, well, how did you know that? And he said, well, that's what she does. And I said, well, do you have any insight into why she does that? And he said, well, in fact, I think I do. He said she, she played the piano for many, many, many years, but the very first song that she learned to play in the Mississippi Delta where she grew up was Dixie. And uh, whenever she gets homesick, he said, she likes to sit down and, and play Dixie. And he said whenever she's playing songs about heaven, she gets homesick. And she just spontaneously breaks into playing Dixie because she's homesick. He said, in other words, whenever she does that, I think what she's saying is that when we get to heaven, it's going to be a lot like home. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Man, that's a great story, and uh, I, I don't want to improve upon anything that, uh, that my Methodist brother would say, but I'm going to improve upon his statement just a bit, if I might. Listen, when we get to heaven, it's not going to be a lot like home, friends. We need to understand that when we get to heaven, it's going to be home. Amen. Fully, finally, and for all. Hallelujah. One of the promises that Jesus made, Brother Tyler, thank you for singing that song because that fits perfectly with what I want to share. One of the promises that Jesus made just before he ascended to be with the Father after his resurrection is, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come again. And I'm going to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's a promise that he made and I'm confident he's going to keep that promise. And that's a promise that we celebrate today on this homecoming of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. And that is the promise that ultimately we're going to all go home and we're going to celebrate in the presence of God the promise of being with him for all eternity. I'm looking forward to that day myself. Now, in what we read a moment ago, Jesus, Jesus had shared with the disciples that, that there was going to come a day whenever the culmination of history would occur. And uh, they asked him earlier in chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew, when is that going to occur? When is that going to happen? And so in Matthew 24, Jesus spent some time offering to the disciples insights into how he was going to culminate history, how he was going to someday come again, and, uh, and he continued that really through the balance of chapter 25 and tucked neatly within uh, this uh, teaching in chapter 24 are, are the words that we read a moment ago, maybe the heart of this entire passage. 
And uh, in these verses, we're reminded of, I think, some very important lessons that we need to keep in mind related to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if, if, if this seems true to you, but, but we're living in an apocalyptic era. Does it not seem rather apocalyptic to you these days? Doesn't it seem like uh, that the world has spun out of control and uh, that uh, there needs to be some reassertion of the control of God in the situation? Well, the way that's going to ultimately occur is Christ is going to come and the kingdom of God is going to be finally established. So we need to understand these lessons about the return of Jesus if indeed we're going to live in the fullness of the faith that we've been called to live as we follow Jesus. And uh, one of the lessons that I, I want to emphasize from Jesus' teaching is this, that his return is going to happen as a mystery. There is mystery surrounding the return of Jesus Christ. Again, if you will, look in verse 36. Jesus said, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. In other words, nobody knows when Christ is going to come again. Now listen, if you're watching TBN, and, and some pastor comes on and says, I know when the Lord is going to come again, and if you'll just send me an offering of $25, I'll give you exactly what you need to know so that you are aware as well. Listen, you better hide your wallet and buckle your purse, okay? Don't do that. Because the fact of the matter is, no one knows when Christ is going to return. Now, having said that, there are what I call some heavenly hints in the scripture that help us understand the seasons that are going to exist whenever Christ returns. And if I might, let me just identify a couple of these heavenly hints that I think help us read the seasons and know, and know the times. Uh, one of those heavenly hints is this. At the end of history, as everything is winding toward the return of Christ, there is going to be what, what I call an explosion of information. A technological touchdown of sorts. Now, if you will, turn to the Old Testament book of Daniel and find chapter 12. And I, I want to read just one, four verses rather from Daniel chapter 12. Focus on one of those four verses. Beginning with verse 1 of chapter 12, this is what God revealed to Daniel. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now, I need to establish here this, this reality, and I want to make sure that I have a consensus before we read verse 4, okay? Now, Daniel lived in about 600 B.C. So he lived 600 years before Jesus was ever born. And... Uh, and, and, and most of what he wrote was written within the context of his very life. But I think once we get to chapter 12, God has pulled back the curtain and is allowing Daniel to see through the corridor of time to the very end of history itself. And I think these verses betray that because he talks about a resurrection of the dead and he talks about uh, all kinds of uh, miracles that are going to occur and the Lamb's book of life being opened, and you know as well as I do from our understanding of Scripture that the only time that's going to happen is at the end. Amen. So are we in agreement that Daniel in these verses is actually speaking about events that are going to occur at the culmination of history? Are you with me on this? Amen. Now listen, folks, I preach until I think you understand, so it behooves you to respond in one way or another, okay? <laughs> You can say amen if you want to. You can nod amen, smile amen. I don't care how you give it. But it'll expedite the process and get us to lunch a lot more quickly if you'll just go ahead and let me know you agree, all right? 
Okay, good. Now I want to go on and read verse 4, given that we have established that truth about this particular passage. In verse 4, Daniel went on to say, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, here it is, don't miss it, and knowledge shall increase. Now, now we're, we're tempted to just sort of gloss over that last phrase. Daniel's talking about what's going to occur at the end of history. And he said it's going to be a time when knowledge increases. Now, I want you to think about something with me for a moment, if you will. I, I don't think, based upon my assessment, and historians uh, support this, that there has ever been an era of history where there has been a greater explosion of technological development than we have experienced in our culture over the last 100 years. In fact, historians say that if you take all of the major inventions that have ever been made by human beings, most of the major inventions that have ever been made would have been made in the last 100 years. It's unprecedented. We're celebrating today, I think it is today, maybe tomorrow, the, the landing of uh, uh, the lunar module on the moon. And uh, I'm wearing one of these digital watches today, and did you know that there's more technology in this digital watch that I'm wearing than there was on the moon, the lunar module that landed on the moon? That's how far we've come since 1969. In, in fact, think about it this way. Uh, up until the early 1900s, we basically walked everywhere we went. If we didn't walk, we rode a horse, we got into a carriage pulled by horses, and for thousands of years, this is the way we mobilize from place to place. We walked, we rode a horse, or we rode in a carriage pulled by horses, and then in the early 1900s, all of a sudden, somebody came up with uh, uh, this idea of uh, machinization, and they made the first motor, and we got in a car, and we began to drive. And so we went from walking to driving in a car, and then it was maybe 40 years later, we literally got onto a, a space module and we launched three men into outer space. And now they're actually saying that sooner or later we're going to be able to get on one of those, or they're going to be able to get on one of those space <laughs> modules and, and go into outer space. And I've got a list of folks I want to be on there, but I don't want to be on there myself. And so listen, this is what I'm saying. In the last 100 years, we've gone from walking to driving to flying to going into outer space, all in 100 years. Is that not warp speed technological development? Is it possible that what Daniel saw in chapter 12, verse 4, is actually coming to culmination in the very age in which we live? It's quite possible. So there's going to be a technological touchdown during the last days, but uh, the scripture also tells us that there's going to be a moral meltdown during those last days. In the book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul, in writing to young Timothy, said to him, in the last days, Timothy, there's going to be times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving God, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This is what it's going to be like in the last days. People are going to absolutely rebel against God and they're going to pursue their own indulgences and be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Has there ever been a day when that was more true than it is today in the United States of America? We have absolutely lost our moral bearings. And we're living in a day where people say, if you want to be a man, be a man. If you want to be a woman, be a woman. Or if you want to be something else, be something else. And I say, are you kidding me? 
and, and the political powers are actually supporting this and moving this agenda forward in many ways. And we are expected simply to accept it as being the developments that are part of our age. I'm inclined to say that it's not just some development that's a part of our age. It is a moral meltdown that was foretold by Scripture itself that is going to be a heavenly hint that we are nearing the end. Now, not only is there going to be a technological touchdown and a moral meltdown, but the Scripture also says there's going to be a crackdown on Christians. If you'll go back to chapter 24, where we started, and look, if you will, in verse 9, Jesus, talking about the last days, said to his disciples, they're going to deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. <laughs> There's going to be a, a, a persecution crackdown on those of us who follow Jesus Christ. Now, we, we are insulated from that here in, in the buckle of the Bible belt in Mississippi, but be assured that throughout the world, there are people this very moment who are being persecuted and perhaps even executed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And there are people in other sectors of the United States, in the Northeast, the Northwest, the Far West, and they're being persecuted and ridiculed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And make no mistake, it's coming to Mississippi as well. It'll get here eventually. And we're going to be persecuted and ridiculed because of, of our belief in Jesus Christ and our commitment to follow His teachings. And that is unfolding before our very eyes. Now, you may say, now, preacher, are you saying that Jesus is going to come again this afternoon or this week or this month or this year? And my response to that would be, no, that's not what I'm saying. I do not know. But what I would say is this, based upon the heavenly hints that we've been given in Scripture, if he does, he will not in any way violate his word. I, I pastored down in New Orleans for about a dozen years before we finally made it to the promised land of Mississippi. <laughs> and uh, one of the churches I pastored was Lakeview Baptist Church, which was destroyed in Hurricane Katrina with, uh, uh, with the breaks in the levee system there. And there was a gentleman in that, in that church who was a brilliant mind. Uh, he was named Mr. Earl Roberts, and, uh, and he was a chemist. Uh, this guy... This guy, you will be glad to know, was the guy that came up with wrinkle-free cotton. I mean, he's the one that identified how to make clothes out of cotton without them wrinkling. Brilliant mind. And he had a hobby, and his hobby was working on grandfather clocks. <laughs> and so I went by his house one day because um, I needed to visit with, uh, with him on something, and, uh, and he had a shop in the back of his house where he did all of his work on the grandfather clocks and uh, his wife Miss Kirk said uh, Earl's in the back and uh, by the way our, our, our granddaughter is back there with him so if she comes barreling out the door whenever you're trying to go in just watch out and uh, so I went back there and uh, Mr. Earl was indeed working on one of the clocks it was an upright clock and uh, of course chimed on the on the hour and uh, so we talk for a few minutes about the purpose of my visit and uh, and then about that time his little granddaughter came running in the door and as she, as she uh, came running, running in the door that clock that he was working on began to chime and it chimed once, twice, five times, ten times, eleven times, twelve times, thirteen times, fourteen times, fifteen times it chimed and his little granddaughter stopped and looked up at him and said, Grandpa, it's later than it's ever been before. <laughs> it wasn't 12 o'clock, it was 15 o'clock in her mind. I've always remembered that because the fact of the matter is, folks, it is later than it has ever been before. Amen. And the hints of Scripture would imply that the return of Christ is very near. So we need to understand that though the return of Christ is a mystery, there are some heavenly hints that we can look to to help us understand the season in which we're living. Now the second 
truth that I want to focus on is uh, what I would call the manner of Christ's return. It is a mystery, but Jesus went on to describe the manner of his return. And if you'll look in verse 37, we'll continue reading. For as were the days of Noah, Jesus went on to say, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Now, I'm not going to get into the weeds on this, but I, I think that uh, what Jesus is communicating is fairly simple here. Uh, Jesus said that uh, one of these days whenever I return, that some people are going to be taken and some people are going to be left behind. Now, now just a simple summation of that is this statement. Not everybody is going to heaven. Some people are not going to go to heaven. Some are going to be left behind doing whatever they're doing whenever the trumpet blows and the king descends. Now this begs the question, well, you know, who is it that gets to go to heaven and who is it that's left behind? That's a good question. One that we all ought to entertain. And uh, the, the simple answer to that question is this. Only those who know Jesus as their Savior are going to get to go to heaven. Anybody who doesn't know Christ as Savior and Lord is going to be left behind. Now, I, I know people who read a passage like this and listen to a statement like the one I just made, and, and they say, how could a good God ever send anybody to hell? How could a good God ever send anybody to hell? <laughs> and the answer to that is this. A good God doesn't send anybody to hell. Did you know that hell was created for Satan? But he'll allow you to go to hell if you refuse to accept him and his love for you. You see, he has made every available concession so that you can go to heaven instead of going to hell. I, I, have, a, I have a little brother and... Uh, I was a typical big brother when we were growing up. I beat up on him as much as I possibly could. But our, our personalities are diametrically opposed. Uh, I grew up to become a pastor. He grew up, joined the military, and is now a 25-year veteran with the Memphis Police Department. I mean, his personality and my personality are about as different as any two brothers could be. Uh, he is impulsive. I mean, he acts first, thinks later. I'm the kind of guy, I'm going to think it through uh, much, much longer than I need to before I make a decision to do anything. I'm going to sit there very methodically and analyze every aspect of it. That's not the way he operates, however. When we were kids, we would, uh, we would sometimes on a, on a hot summer day when it was maybe a little bit too hot to be outside, we would sit down and play a game of checkers. And I'm going to tell you how a checkers game went between my brother and I. Uh, it's his move. He doesn't think about it. He doesn't evaluate the board. He just makes a move. It's my move. And I'm, I'm looking at the board and I'm evaluating and analyzing every move that I could make and the counter move that he's going to make to that. And I'm thinking about it. And, uh, and it wasn't unusual at all for my little brother Chris to say, Sean, it's your move. Sean, did you forget? It's your move. <laughs> so I was pastoring down in New Orleans, and uh, I was driving to Alexandria, Louisiana, one day to attend a state convention meeting, and I was on Interstate 10. I was crossing the Mississippi River in Baton Rouge. And as I was climbing up that ramp to cross over the river, there was a billboard to the right that was, that was very obvious and stark. I noticed it. And it was a very simple billboard. It was a white background only. And it was a picture of Jesus with the crown of thorns on his head, blood dripping down his cheek. 
And there was a three-word caption at the bottom of that billboard, white background, Jesus hanging on the cross. And the caption at the bottom said, it's your move. It's your move. In other words, God has made his move. He has done everything necessary for any sinner in this world to be set free from the shackles of sin in their lives and delivered into the light of God's glory. And the fact of the matter is, God doesn't send anybody to hell, but if indeed you refuse to accept his gift of grace, then ultimately you decide to go to hell yourself. And I want to be very clear about this. Nobody is going to heaven because you're a member of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church or any other Baptist church that exists in the state of Mississippi. You're not going to heaven because your parents are going to heaven. You're not going to heaven because you attend Sunday school, give an offering, or are regular here in worship services. You're not going to heaven because you're kind to your neighbors or good to your spouse. The only way that any of us can go to heaven is whenever our sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ, and we have been set free from the shackles of our sin. That's the only way. And what Jesus is saying is that the manner of his return is going to, is going to reveal those who have made that decision and those who have refused to make that decision. Now, the last thing I want to say real quickly is this. Jesus also gave us a mandate in light of what he has already shared. A mandate on how we ought to live our lives based on the promise of his return. And if you go back to verse 42, we'll read these final verses where Jesus said, Therefore, stay awake. It's a favorite verse of most Baptist preachers, Brother Blaine. Stay awake. <laughs> For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken in two. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, in these verses, Jesus is addressing those of us who are his followers. And, uh, and his instruction to us, his mandate to us is, be ready, stay awake, be alert, be watching, because he may come at any moment, and when he does come, you want to make sure that you're watching for him. Amen. You want to make sure that you're alert, awake, and expecting him to come. I'm afraid far too many of us live our lives high, wide, and handsome with no thought for the fact that Jesus could return today. We have driven our tent pegs too deeply into this sinful soil, and we have made a home right here in this world and very seldom think about the fact that Jesus is going to come. And I, for one, want to challenge us all today. Let's be looking for the fact that the trumpet could sound, the cloud could descend, and the king could come even today. <laughs> when, when we were living in New Orleans, as, as I, I mentioned a moment ago, we, we were living, Pastor Blaine, in a in a pastorium that was probably about seven or eight blocks from the church I was pastoring, Lakeview Baptist Church. And so that afforded me the privilege most every day of getting into my car at lunchtime and driving to our house and having lunch with my wife and our two young children. They're grown now, and one of them has a 14-month-old uh, grandson, which is certainly a blessing by every standard. But at that time, they were... They were probably about four years old and maybe two years old, maybe even younger than that. And, and so my routine was at about 12 o'clock, I'd get in my car, I'd drive the eight blocks, I'd pull up into the front of our house, park on the curb, get out, walk to the front door, go in, have lunch with Elizabeth and the kids, and then I'd, I'd leave afterwards and go back to the office for visiting or studying or meetings or whatever the case may be. And uh, so we had on our... Uh, front door, we had a solid wood door, and then we also had a solid glass pane storm door. And so Elizabeth would most of the time open the wooden door when she knew that it was about time for me to get home for, uh, for lunch, and I would pull up there, and, and both of my kids would be standing there at that glass door waiting on me. Now, 
Elizabeth is a very meticulous housekeeper. I need to, I need to preface what I'm about to say with that, with that affirmation. She's a very meticulous housekeeper. She likes everything just so-so. But the bottom half of that door, I said, honey, if you don't mind, just don't, don't ever clean the bottom half of that. I know it's going to go against your instincts, your instincts and your intuition, but don't clean the bottom half of that door if you don't mind. And she said, well, why is that? And I said, well, whenever I pull up, and I see that glass door, it's, the bottom half of it just looked awful. I mean, I mean our, our little girl would have fingerprints all over the bottom half of that door. Our little boy who was about two years old, listen, if it came out of him, it was on that door, okay? I'm just telling you right now. And, and it'd be smeared and just, you know, just everything all over the bottom half of that door looked awful and was very contrary to her instincts as a housewife, but I'm going to tell you something, every time I pulled up there and I saw all those fingerprints on that door, I thought to myself, boy, that is the joy of a father because I know that my children have been standing there looking for their dad to come home for lunch. And you know what I'm hoping and praying? I'm hoping and praying for me, I'm hoping and praying for each one of you that one of these days when the trumpet of the Lord sounds and the king descends, that he finds some fingerprints on the windows of your heart because you've been standing there looking for him, waiting for him, expecting him to come again. Now, the ways that we can be alert and, and, and stand ready for him to come, worship him on a regular basis, stay in his word, stay on our knees, share the gospel with others around us, be engaged in service with the utilization of the spiritual gifts God has given us. Focus our lives completely on Him. And as you focus your life completely on Him, you're making fingerprints on those windows that show that you've been standing there waiting for the return of the Lord. So, be ready. Stay awake. The return of Christ is indeed mysterious. We don't know when it is going to occur. But we have every reason to believe that we might be in the very season itself when he returns because of those heavenly hints given to us in Scripture. The manner of his return is going to be stark and probably going to be surprising for a lot of people because not everybody is going to heaven, only those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And consequently, we ought to be living our lives today expecting his return. Now, if, if anything I've said today is disturbing to you, I won't talk to you for just a second, okay? If anything I've said today is disturbing because you're not real sure whether or not you're going to heaven when you die, and you're not confident that if Christ returned today that you would be among those who are taken away, or maybe you'll be among those who are left behind. And that creates a little bit of anxiety and fear within you as you hear a, a message like this. I want to tell you what you need to do. You need to get ready today. Amen. You need to just go ahead and get ready right now. Go ahead and get ready before you leave the worship center today. Go ahead and get ready. I, uh, I mentioned my little brother earlier in the message. He, he grew up, joined the army, went airborne. And became an army ranger. Was an army ranger. I still remember when he came home from ranger school. Being amazed. At how my little brother had grown up. That was precisely the moment I quit beating up on my little brother. <laughs> and I remember sitting there talking to my, to my little bro. And I, I said hey. Chris, I said, uh, man, I can't imagine anybody jumping out of a perfectly good flying airplane. <laughs> what is the most frightening part about jumping out of an airplane? And I, I was expecting him to say maybe when the alarm sounds and you have to line up and you know it's coming. Or maybe when you get right up to the ledge and you're the next guy in line. Or maybe when you take that step out. Maybe that's the most frightening part about jumping out of an airplane. That's what I fully expected him to say. But what he said 
was not what I expected, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, Sean, I'll tell you what, the most frightening part about jumping out of an airplane is packing the parachute. He said, if you have plenty of time to pack your parachute and you make sure that everything is folded in just right, all the lines are free and clear, he said, uh, when you jump out of that airplane, it is the funnest thing you are ever going to do in all of your life. But he said, if you have to pack that parachute hurriedly and you're not sure you got the folds just right and you're not sure all the lines are untangled, whenever you step up to jump out of that airplane, it is an absolutely horrifying experience. He said, yeah, the most frightening part about jumping out of an airplane is packing the parachute. <laughs> In other words, this is what my little brother is saying. Listen, if you're prepared, you don't have to be afraid. Amen. And there may be some of you in the crowd today and you're not prepared for the sound of the trumpet, the coming of the king, and the exit of the saved. And you'd like to just go ahead and get prepared today. Well, all you have to do, my friends, is confess your sin, put your faith in Jesus Christ, and trust that his payment for your sin on the cross is sufficient and allow the grace of God to change you today so that you'll never be the same. Amen. And if you're willing to do that, then you can make sure your parachute's packed, your ticket is purchased, and your preparation is made. And you don't have to be afraid of anything that may be coming. So in just a few minutes, we're going to sing together a hymn of invitation softly and tenderly. And if God has spoken to you, I want to make sure that you have the opportunity today to respond to him. Let's bow together and let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege we've had to open the Bible and read it and think about what it means for us. And uh, Lord, I, I do pray that you would help us today to recognize your voice. And uh, Father, I pray that you would help us to respond in submission to your call. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you for all those in the crowd who are believers and live their lives in such a way so as to honor you. I, I ask, Lord, that you would assure them of uh, their preparation today and that you would give them joy in the hope of knowing that, that someday you're going to fulfill the promise you made that uh, you're going to come again. Uh, Father, if there are some who may be prepared ultimately but they haven't been living their lives in such a way that they're going to, they're going to be happy to see you, they're, they're going to be ashamed to see you because they've, they've been living selfishly and, and they've been living rebelliously and stubbornly. I pray in this moment that your spirit would convict them and that you would draw them back to the cross, to the very place where they came to know you to begin with. And Lord, I pray that you would lead them to rededicate their lives in such a way that they might live for you moving forward. But Father, if there are some here today and they have never come to know you as Savior and Lord, may the Holy Spirit so touch them and uh, convict them that they would not be able to leave this place without doing business with you. Show them their sin. Show them your love. Show them the way that you've made available through Jesus Christ and give them the courage and the conviction to stand up, to take up their cross, and to follow you. And I pray that this would be the day of salvation for them and a day of joy for your angels in heaven. And I pray this in the name of Jesus our Lord.